see. Our next speaker is an activist and speaker who has coordinated the TZM Scotland chapter while finishing his studies at the University of Glasgow. He's edited and written for the TZM blog and is on the board of a transition town charity, working on projects around localising industry and building a circular economy. He gave a talk last year and is returning again to continue the train of thought he laid down. Here to give a talk entitled A Transitionary Exercise, please welcome back to the stage, Andrew Drummond. Okay, like I'm saying, my talk today is a bit of a follow-on from uh, my talk last year, which was before covering a bit about the challenges of transitioning into a fully renewable energy economy. Um, so the first little bit will be a brief update on that, what's happening in our energy economy, and then I'll be looking at uh, practical models. So sort of the um, like good news second half of what I was talking about last year will be expanded on so ways that we can build systems to meet our basic needs sustainably and then the kinds of organizations and models that can support that. So there's a link to it. If you haven't seen it, I'd highly recommend it. And so my little update on that is uh, what's going on in sort of storage systems. So there are lots of things I couldn't cover before um, around you know, there are all kinds of options out there contending for how we can store our energy to deal with the problems of uh, hydrogen needing a lot of energy input to create it, or you know, the, uh, the shortage of lithium for you know, filling out our uh, grids with batteries to balance the load between winter and summer, that kind of thing. There are a couple of good options for slightly different uses. So cryogenic energy storage is one of these. It, it's uh, compressing air, not just into tanks where it's highly compressed, but into a liquid form. So essentially creating liquid nitrogen and that kind of thing. And it's been improved in recent years in its efficiency so that you save the energy that goes in and out in the compression and expansion cycles. And the uh, there have been test beds of this in uh, next to power plants, sort of getting up to like ninety percent efficiency, approaching what you can get with batteries. Essentially, and it's a lot more cheap and scalable because it simply uses refrigeration tech. Um, and yeah, if anybody's feeling like taking pictures, I will have uh, a link to all my notes at the end, and I can give you like the slides by Bluetooth if you like. And then trying to deal with the uh, the shortfalls, how we. Uh, power our trucks and things that need very dense energy for moving things about, like ships. There's been a suggestion of using ammonia as a carrier for hydrogen because we have this trouble with the hydrogen economy that uh, hydrogen being the smallest and lightest molecule, it, it well, it would either take up a lot of space or you need to compress it to extreme pressures to contain it, which becomes dangerous and it will leak out of any tank that it's put into. But using um, Ammonia as a carrier, it's something that we already do quite a bit in our industry for creating nitrogen fertilizers for conventional agriculture. And there's all this industry sort of sitting there that can be used for that. Um, it just needs to be updated to renewable methods, and so there's a lot of uh, development going on around that. And I'd like to point you to something of briefly mentioned last year, there's a great YouTuber, a fellow called Peter Hadfield, who's written for New Scientist and even the uh, private side, because he's quite a comic, has done some really brilliant uh, videos talking about kind of criticisms of uh, climate science out on the web and debunking those, but there are a couple of um, interesting things he put in over the new year, trying to uh, encourage conservatives around why they should support um, a movement to you know, tackle climate change and looking at previous conservative support for that before there was this hard party line on it. But unfortunately, they were kind of opinion pieces and not as rigorous as previous videos. So I want to look at how you can... There were a couple of ideas picked up that weren't so solid in there, like uh, sort of saying that you could use... There were some... These were both things published in Science Magazine 
the aluminium graphene battery is something tested in China, and it's great that it has a long lifetime, but it's sort of how much energy you can get into a space is much lower than typical batteries, um, and it essentially puts it between capacitors used in computers and a, a battery you might have on your phone. It's not much use for grid scale things. Whereas uh, there's another article I referred to about an ammonia fuel cell. There's a great thing about it that it makes um, ammonia production much more efficient, but it's extremely slow. And so you need to be very skeptical when people tell you they found some silver bullet that will solve a problem in our energy system, that there can be some severe, like, hard physical limits to what can be done with it. And these are just plotted on the graph I showed last year, just where some of these sit. So ammonia, if we could get it going as uh, a renewable fuel produced from renewable energy, you could possibly run cars or trucks and that kind of thing. It would be much better than using batteries for our mileage and that, but it's still not a kind of thing you could use to fly planes with. So it's just not compact enough and unless some uh, solution is developed for that. We're going to be saying goodbye to our airline industry in the uh, next few decades. And so people often ask uh, TZM if they have, you know, a solid transition plan covering sort of a broad scale of things we can do. And there's already a very good example uh, from these guys, Rob Diaz and Dan O'Neill, wrote a book several years ago called "Enough Is Enough: Building a Sustainable Economy in a World of Finite Resources." And it lays out in relatively simple terms on a, a broad economic scale the things that we need to do from that high level of to make a change and create a more steady system that's not going to keep growing. And it's a great book to give to, say, somebody if they're entrenched in the mindset of government and business that the only way we can have a functioning economy is to continually grow it. It explains how we can have an economy that's prosperous without growth. And then more to the, the practical grassroots scale of uh, products that people can get involved with. Rob Hopkins of the Transition Movement has written some great books on that, but his later one in that line, The Transition Companion, has uh, lots of case studies and sort of experience from their movements in it and can show you how to create your own local movement that makes a change. And you don't even need to be very technically minded to make a difference in this transition to a renewable economy. As one of the examples late in Enough is Enough showed, just quite amazing, on the role of arts in a big change. So there are some people in what's called the Population Media Center who broadcast a sort of soap opera style radio show that was trying to tackle issues around sexual health and women's rights in uh, some communities that had severe issues with this. And while the uh, sorry, the statistics that came through are quite impressive about in just a couple of years dropping down the number of children born and uh, increasing the conversations people were having around this and awareness, one of the most amazing things uh, was mentioned in PMC's own report was around the emotional outpouring from people in there, where they said they'd received uh, lots of letters, and one person had written in to thank them because they'd had, uh, in previous years, their daughter had been abducted on the way to school and forced into marriage at the age of 14, and this was not dealt with because in that community at the time it was just seen as the way things are and as a result of this um, radio show going out and changing communities' perspectives over a long period of time, these kinds of people were turned on by their community and more punitive measures were taken against them and this person had written into um, the authors of this saying that they wanted them to keep this up on the air because as a result of this they felt they were children are now safe to walk to school as a result of a cultural shift that came around this. So it's just a strong show that just uh, the arts can have a huge transformational effect in, in when put in the right place. 
So I'm sorry, you're going to get on to the more technical bits for people who want those around what things we can do. Uh, so I'll be looking at how you can create sort of fragments of a whole circular economy um, from different aspects like food growing, goods production, living and housing, and how you fund these kinds of things. So just for a, a quick example, with uh, energy storage, if we have a big build out in, say, wind power and we have you know, these huge peaks and we don't have all the uh, storage capacity to use it in batteries, it doesn't have to necessarily go back into the grid. One of the ways things can be stored is in chemicals that are then used within the rest of our economy. So, for instance, just the one next, least sort of less simple step of uh, water electrolysis from simply getting hydrogen out of water. If you were doing it with salt water instead, you get three productive um, sort of outputs from this already. You get hydrogen, chlorine gas, and lye, all of which, you know, those are used in cleaning and various chemical processes after that, which can build into industry. So it's just, there are many more possible uh, processes that you can power from renewable energy and create a productive output that doesn't need to go back in the grids. We just need to get more in that mindset of uh, how we can utilize it. And so there are just some uh, key technologies that could be used within a food circular economy that I'll show in a second. So if you don't know what a, a biogas digester is, it's uh, a system that's used a bit like a septic tank, except uh, you may see these on farms sometimes, you can see a big sort of plastic dome structure. What they're doing is taking wastes like uh, the stalks from plants or weeds that aren't, which otherwise just be burned off in some settings that aren't you know, looking at you know, being responsible with what they're doing. Um, so you would put them into a tank seeded with gut bacteria and essentially instead of having methane rising off a compost heap and adding to uh, your global warming potential a little bit, you contain the gas and you can use it as a fuel in this kind of system and its main product at the end is an organic liquid fertilizer that you could then use in something like hydroponics. As I'll show in a second, there have also been uh, people testing using fungi culture, that's the growing of mushrooms, uh, using wastes from other processes. And so you, you can combine these kinds of technologies in sort of a self-reinforcing system such as this. You can take, uh, for instance, fruit and garden wastes uh, in and put them into where you've either got your compost heaps or your biogas digester can create methane for you, which could warm up your hydroponic greenhouse or your mushroom cultivation bed, and then get productive still results out of these, like the uh, mushroom cultivation, creating something that's a very good input to compost production again. The great thing about the system is you could start off with a project on any single one of these you know, subsystems and then sort of build out. And here's just a, a case study of how this is being done. As uh, so a group started in the north of Scotland where they're taking spent grains from distilleries making whiskey, which is sadly our main export up there at the moment. Uh, at least where I'm staying and that and shortbread. <laughs> <laughs> and that and spent you know coffee grains and this has made an excellent uh, sort of beds for growing mushrooms out of and so they've been doing this in a few sites where they had just some waste heat coming off of say this distilling process they would drop in a container next to it with uh, mushroom growing beds in it and they produced high quality gourmet mushrooms that they were then given to restaurants and they They've had a, a crowdfunding page up, but they are also selling ready meals made with mushrooms, which is pretty great. Uh, and also, they uh, you don't need to just buy all the kit for this. They also decided to try and run this with groups as kind of a, a consultancy service model kind of thing, so that they could supply technology to people if they provided you know a place to do it and people willing to work on it. And then there's another great group in America who are trying to bridge that kind of gap between the big 
uh, you know, mass wide fields monocrop agriculture, where we have that practice of trying to automate things as much as possible by dragging a big tractor across the field and simplifying the problem, then creates its own pest and disease problems because of the big, you know, monocrop bed being food for whatever attacks it. And then on the opposite end of the scale, having your small organic gardens where people, you know, it takes, it's a lot more labor intensive to grow on a small scale, but it's much more resilient. So they try to create something that bridges that gap by making sort of small scale growing more automated. And they created this uh, robot system, a bit like the uh, RepRap 3D printer projects. They've made it open source, but only after they sold these kits to early adopters so they could keep their kind of self-fund themselves a bit. But it is now open source and anybody can hack around with these designs of it. And they do cost rather a lot, but then they did a calculation on their website that if you had got one of these kits, it would pay for itself in nearly free vegetables, as they you know, calculated in all the water and seed inputs and your time, essentially. It would pay for itself within around five years or less if you had a bigger raised bed, and they introduced sort of a payment plan for that kind of thing. So it's something you could do on a community level that would be high-tech and produce foods. Of course, there are bigger businesses out there having enormous uh, greenhouses where they've got quite, I guess, uh, I've lost the word. <laughs> Sophisticated, you know, robotic systems that you may see on the web. But if you're trying to start something at a grassroots level, this is more accessible. And then an interesting example from uh, the Permaculture Research Institute in Australia. They put a couple of videos up a few years ago. Jeff, their kind of director of there, went on a visit to a group called Vermont Compost in America, looking at a system where they had chickens on a farm that was not only free range, but had no fences. The chickens were free to leave. The only thing keeping them there in fact, they didn't buy any grain to feed their chickens with because the natural behavior of chickens when they were out in the jungle wasn't going to a farm and eating grain. It was scratching through the undergrowth, looking for bugs and things like that. So they just brought in food wastes from local restaurants and a bit of manure and they mixed this into sort of a, a compost heap that the chickens would go after. And they loved that. And because they had no costs, they had no needs to cull the males, which is common in your usual chicken farms, and it just produced a really high quality uh, compost products, and then Jeff sort of adapted this to a smaller scale that could be used on a small organic farm and just go across a landscape and the chickens would scratch out all of the, uh, the weeds in their way, going after the bugs, and it would be a great way to clear out the fields or uh, you know, cover the surface of an orchard with a great additive, you know, for the health of the plants growing after that, without the use of a lot of oil going into a tractor, although it was a much slower moving thing than a tractor, as you can imagine. And then lastly, another fun example that kind of bridges different disciplines of something you could do. A couple of amazing people in the northeast of Scotland started this group that's been taking people out on uh, sort of wildlife skills and well-being courses has this uh, sort of amazing virtuous cycle in it that they're teaching people about nature and how to look after the forest, at the same time just improving people's mental well-being just through being out in nature and in some parts trying to you know, improve the health of their lands. And it sadly is a, a project that's grant funded at the moment, but if you can find other ways of supporting something like this, on a volunteer basis, it's a, a great sort of cross-disciplinary combination that's, you know, it has a great all-round effect. So it's just a, a more structured look at something I was talking about last year. If you wanted to create a localized sort of resource-based economy to build out from, you could do this with, say, an input of uh, wastes picked up, say, like 
cans of bottles or your electronic space is something that I'm looking at a bit myself and how when you separate them out into your separate parts you'll end up with different raw materials and it's just a look at the kinds of processes that you would go through so you could end up having inputs to uh, 3D printing and injection molding on a local level although some of that down the bottom there is just hypothetical at the moment something that I'm researching a bit myself and this would make a great input into your typical so for hack spaces and libraries of things, which is a, a movement that's spreading across the world at the moment, because even though it's usually run on a, a membership payment basis, a lot of places do this on pay as much as you can or wish to, and they still can be very well self-sustaining if managed properly. And it's a, a great way for local communities to have a huge impact on the uh, amounts of energy and resources that they're using because it's impacting on a lot of energy that's been invested in the tools and the things that we use. And co-housing is just another example of how we can have a big impact. Everywhere that housing has been taken seriously, uh, we'll take adapting to a problem such as um, building a hotel, or whether it's student accommodation, or even a ship or a military base, anywhere a, a very technical approach is taken, you don't tend to put a washing machine in every single living unit that people have. It makes no sense because they're all then necessarily made at a lower quality and all keep breaking down and using a lot of materials. And so if we, if we can change our housing paradigm to where co-housing blocks not necessarily the kind of failures that we've had with huge high-rise flats before, but at the right kind of scale, if people had shared facilities for their cooking, washing, all kinds of things, leisure, a local tool library, this kind of thing, if it can be built into new housing structures, that can make a big difference. But of course, as we know, young people are finding it harder and harder to get into the housing market, and so, getting into this as uh, a business of your own becomes even more difficult. So one of the best ways to approach this may be around the policy level on uh, the way we set housing standards and what needs to be built. I think that's all of that. And then there's one last little example of where this can be difficult and confusing. In that uh, when Whenever you try to sell a lot of something, it's hard to find, uh, if you're trying to sell something cheaply, you end up having to spend more to start up because your competitors in that kind of market will already have, you know, be doing something at a low cost if they invest it. It's the trouble of kind of the difference between 3D printing something and injection molding something is whether you want to make a few or a million of something when you put in a lot of energy and resources, it costs less in per unit that you make, which is called the marginal cost of production. And so you can see uh, a difference between that sold thing as Morgan cars in the UK versus the uh, upgraded Tesla factories in the US. This was a problem that Elon Musk tried to approach and that you know, it was initially criticized for making cars for the rich, but it's a problem that you can't easily get into a market starting with this kind of thing and make something affordable to the general public in this kind of market system. And so he's put out this uh, master plan on his blog there that almost nobody read while he was being criticized throughout the press. But his plan was to, you know, start off and making a few cars that were very expensive and iterate design to make them cheaper and cheaper and it's just been updated in the last few years that they're also trying to pivot into just a completely different model where you wouldn't be trying to sell cars to people but with this automated driving system have them more as a taxi service that people would pick up as and when they need it so they wouldn't have to keep building more and more of them and could still have an input that keeps them up so by stopping there, 
they've avoided a more extreme end of uh, this growth that a lot of other companies got into. It's funny, to, uh, he noted on there that of all the car companies that started in the US, the only two that haven't gone bankrupt and asked for bailouts are Ford and Tesla. So it's a really bad idea to start a car company in that way, but they'd all gone down this line of eventually investing so much and being told by their investors to keep growing that a lot of companies do this and they make so many things that they have to advertise and tell everyone that you need this when there wasn't demand for something before. And when people don't buy out of it, they fail and beg to the government for bailouts as we saw in the last few years. So in the book Enough is Enough, they're asking sort of how can we keep industries at a scale that's just right? And they have this diagram of uh, how industries should be directed to what they call a steady state economy. So that if you were in a developing country, you may find that degrowth is not what you need. As uh, we're commonly told by economists, that growth is great for uh, improving the living standards of the poor, but that's not the only part of the story. They only get a tiny bit of trickle down from that kind of rise. It's mostly increased the, uh, the consumption of people in richer countries. In fact, we need growth in poorer countries, but degrowth in countries that are overproducing and over consuming. And so a country that found itself uh, you know, in either one of those undesirable areas would need to shift to you know, growth or degrowth as needed and try and meet this kind of Goldilocks scale of what's meeting the local people's needs there. And there are, as we'll get into in a second, some approaches to making sure we can do this and guide companies through it without having to uh, go through you know, inflationary spirals or deflationary or any of that kind of thing. One example is different kinds of uh, banking systems. So there's a, a great book on the history of sort of debt and money by David Graeber called Debt the First 5,000 Years, where he lays bare there's a terrible myth in economics saying that we have gone from a barter system where people would trade a cow and hope to get grain and go around, which is a ridiculous idea when you think about it, and that somehow we had created currency and then moved on to credit, which is all nonsense historically in the anthropology that we've found so far. Uh, the, the idea of credit has existed far longer than money in terms of currency has, but it was very different thousands of years ago. It's more like going and doing a favor for your neighbor and there are different levels, so within families, as we generally understand it, we have something of a gift economy where we give and we don't expect anything back right away. In fact, we don't expect anybody to clear our, what is called in financial speak, balance. We don't, you know, we give unconditionally to those we love most and systems of credit were created in history just marking up tallies of things like bushels of grain as measurement indicators before we had formal currency to you know, mark how much somebody had given an input out of a town scale system. They were yeah, kind of intermediaries between people who didn't know each other and couldn't expect a return in favor. But time banking has been created as a more modern system to enable this uh, without having this need for growth that's generally created by applying interest to credit. So people do this with having a balance where you just give a favor to someone and it's you don't expect anything back right away. You get uh, a level shown of how much you've put into your local economy or community and then people sort of pay it forward. They go and give favors to other people. And uh, there's also an excellent book written by Charles Eisenstein called Sacred Economics. And it might sound 
It might sound kind of wishy-washy to someone who's technically minded, like it might be something very spiritual, but it's actually a very good book that lays out a very practical and philosophical argument for why we shouldn't have uh, an interest system and how a negative interest system, that is, if someone has a lot of money hoarded up, it would decrease in value, how that would be a lot more practical, especially if we're trying to degrow our economy to something that's more of a sustainable level. If you, there have been tests of this in the past, and when people aren't earning interest on deposits, they're more likely to go out and spend it on services, and little changes in that kind of negative interest rate can keep an economy you know, going and not collapsing if you're trying to, I guess, shrink the size of it. And they're just, yeah, generally excellent initiatives. You should check out some of these. The Brixton Pound is a great example, where which people can you know, already pay by text for favours, but it needs to be expanded out. And so, some people, you know, you'll hear businessmen ask, is profit a dirty word? But when someone's asking that question, or trying to deny that it is, they've kind of already ex accepted that profit has become a dirty word, but they don't understand why. And you know, most people might think of profit as in just making back more than you put in, as a, a small business owner might do. But the, uh, the main way it's used in economics is to describe not a small private company, but shareholder corporations. The difference with them being that it's not just a bit extra going back to managers, but there are people you know, who are necessarily just parasitic on what's coming out of corporations. Shareholders make absolutely no contribution to what's going on in them. And so this is kind of the thing we want to avoid. Is, uh, there was an example in 1918 that Henry Ford had wanted to hire more workers to spread the benefits of his company's success to you know, more people instead of paying increased profits to private shareholders. But he'd ended up going to court against the shareholders, which forced him to pay a special dividends to them. And so it's been well established since then that corporations are legally obliged to maximize their profit. That's their main motive. They don't get to make any other uh, sort of social goal to what they're doing, no matter how, I guess, altruistic the aims of their CEO may be. And, uh, you know, some people may see the complete polar opposite of this as, say, registered charity can be quite difficult to set up. So there are you know, minimum requirements of having a board in charge of a charity and it can be quite inflexible and I guess you know, difficult for some people who don't have a large network to set that up with and they can, you know, because they have this board that's separate from paid management of a group, it, they have a history of responding very slowly to things. So yeah, I was just having a funny look at what the advantages and disadvantages of these. That was the only advantage I could really think of as a shareholder corporation, is that in a marketplace, because they have so little responsibility, they have their advantage by not caring what they do and just going after anything that will increase their profit. And these are you know, generally thought of as the two opposite possibilities with maybe small private companies in between, but there are more options these days of how you could start up your organization of things called public benefit corporations. There are different versions of these. For instance, in the UK, the community interest company could be as simple as one person with their little business, they register their sort of charitable-like interests and they can be in control of it that way. Or you can go to cooperative kinds of organizations, which are great to set up with a community. The advantages there, you can uh, see some of the figures on how cooperatives fared in the global financial crisis several years ago. Twice as many uh, cooperatives 
survived their first years of operation as other types of business structures. And in that financial crisis, cooperative banks made up around a third of the group's lending in Europe, and yet they only accounted for 8% of the losses over the whole crisis. And it's just a great example of ways you can use this. Community-supported agriculture schemes, also known as just a food box scheme, are ways that people subscribe to a farm and help them to have a regular, I guess, customer base and knowing that they'll have the support of their community. And so there are farms not just growing monoculture cash crop, but supplying regular boxes of food that you need, so from a, di a diverse range of crops, and in this way, yeah, they, they secure the resilience of their farm by not growing a monocrop, and people get a lot of more convenience of not having go to go to a supermarket or anywhere like that to pick their food up. And there are just many more kinds of paradigms that you could replace, just a few ideas. I could go on all about it all day, but sell. Hand over in just a second. So, you know, fast read, there are many other ways we could um, distribute our things. Say so we have this whole problem of our plastic distributed bottles of milk when a couple of decades ago we used to have dairies across the country that would deliver glass bottles that were then washed, all the standard size. We need to get back to that. And if people can start up with that kind of business, say from a vegan approach. There's an example of the company Huel who provides sort of powders that can create uh, smoothies at a fair price, but you may be able to improve on this kind of system. And these are all things that I like to do myself, but I can't you know, have the, the time to go through all of these kinds of initiatives. So people around the world need to get on top of that. And that's all I've got for today.